A nome del comitato organizzatore di Festival Letteratura, ringraziamo Gruppo TEA per aver contribuito alla realizzazione di questo evento, che fa parte di Accenti, incontri lampo per spettatori esigenti, e diamo il benvenuto a Joshua Hohen, e presenta Giovanni Zucca. Per riascoltare gli eventi delle edizioni precedenti visitate il sito archivio.festivalletteratura.it da dove da gennaio 2020 troverete anche gli audio di questa edizione. Buongiorno, good morning. Nonostante il tempo non sia diciamo, proprio decisamente molto favorevole, grazie di essere qui numerosi al riparo della, della tenda Sordello, per dare il benvenuto a Joshua Cohen, che viene da, vive a New York e viene da Atlantic City, New Jersey, e se pensate subito ai Soprano, Avete un pochino ragione perché uno dei suoi romanzi, quello che il vento ha già rovesciato, è stato definito una, una sorta di soprano completamente però diverso da quello che, che noi conosciamo. Di Joshua Cohen è appena uscito il libro dei numeri, che qualcuno ha definito un Ulisse per l'era di internet, sono queste cose molto belle che sanno fare soltanto gli editori, eh, è stato definito uno dei più promettenti scrittori americani delle nuove generazioni, adesso noi lo ascolteremo. Come sapete l'incontro sarà unicamente in, in lingua inglese, eh, Mr. Cohen ci dice che alla fine mh, se qualcuno ha qual qualche domanda ovviamente in lingua sarà lieto di, di rispondere. 30 minuti con Joshua Cohen, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is everyone else cold? Yeah. Um, so if I'm speaking too quickly, just throw something at me, it's fine. Um, I'm gonna, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a few things. Maybe I'm, I'm gonna read a little bit from, from Book of Numbers in, 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 uh, in English, and, um, which is now just out, I guess, yesterday or the day before in Italian. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a beautiful translation um, by Claudia D'Aristanti. And uh, Book of Numbers is a, is a story really, um, I hate the word about, about two people. It, it's with two people. It's not about anything. It's with two people. Uh, uh, one is a, an internet tech mogul, tech CEO, and, and the other is a, a guy who's being paid to ghostwrite his autobiography, uh, his memoir. Uh, and they have the same name, uh, which happens to be my name, but that's not important. Um, and so I wanted to read two voices, because the, the, this book really has two voices, the voice of the, the ghostwriter and, uh, and the voice of the subject. Um, and then, of course, in the book, those two voices get melded together when the ghostwriter has to inhabit the voice of his subject. And um, what they're really talking about, and the, 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 the kind of ghost topic of the memoir is really a history of, um, of the internet from really from about 1971 and a history of, of the Bay Area in, in the United States um, from the, the late 60s, early 70s. So without boring you anymore, here's the, 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 just the first little section in the voice of the, the ghost writer. If you're reading this on a screen, fuck off. I'll only talk if I'm gripped with both hands, paper of pulp, covers of board and cloth, the thread from thread stuff, or what are the bindings made of, hair and plant fibers, glue from boiled horse hooves. The paperback book was compromised enough, and that's what I've become, paper spine, paper limbs, brain of cheapo crumpled paper, the final type that publishers used before surrendering to the touch displays, that bad, thin, four times de-inked recycled crap, 
100% acid-free post-consumer waste. I'm writing a memoir, half biography, half autobiography, it feels. I'm writing the memoir of a man, not me. It begins in a resort, a suite. I'm holed up here, blackout shades downed, drowned in loud media, all to keep from having to deal with yet another country outside the window. If I'd kept the eye mask and earplugs from the jet, I wouldn't even have to describe this. There's nothing worse than description. Hotel room prose. No characterization is worse. No dialogue is worse. Suffice it to say that the pillows here are each the size of the bed I used to share in New York. Anyway, this isn't quite a hotel. It's a cemetery for people both deceased and on vacation who still check in daily with work. As for yours truly, I sit with my laptop atop a pillow on my lap to keep the wireless hotspot particles from reaching my genitals and frying my sperm. So that's just the little introduction section. Um, I wanted to... Uh, All right, I'll, I'll do the, the true autobiographical part. This, is, uh, 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 this next section is sort of a, uh, a section about the tech mogul's sort of first um, indication of what the internet could be, um, which I set uh, uh, on the beach with... Um, with his grandfather. So in this scene, the, the, the tech mogul is, 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 a, is a young kid, and he's walking on the beach with his grandfather, who is explaining the constellations to him, the stars. And, um, and his grandfather essentially claims that when people, uh, uh, that, that early astronomers uh, uh, and emotional astronomers, astrologers, <laughs> Uh, astrologists uh, invented the internet before they even knew what they were doing. Um, and, uh, yeah. I also wanted to read this section because it's, it's, this is the end of the summer. This is really the end of the summer. And this is a, a sort of a summer section uh, on the beach. And uh, and also, I can do whatever I want today because it's my birthday. Thank you. So, that that gets the biggest applause. What do you say? How I am today? I am 39 years old. Thank you. I like how that's it. You write a fucking book and people congratulate you for being old, 39. It's like, this was a lot harder than just living until now, you know? The living was easy. Uh, so the name of the tech mogul in this is, is Joshua Cohen and uh, his father's name is, uh, his grandfather's name is Joseph. That evening, Joseph took his grandson for a walk on the beach. Cohen liked the air. He liked being under the sky. What impressed him the most was how his grandfather knew the names of all the trees on the way to the beach, and even knew the names of the rocks and the stones and the game was that Cohen would point at one or pick one up, and his grandfather would tell him what it was. And in doing so, he would bring it into being. Joseph, his grandfather, was also familiar with the shells and related to Cohen how shells were the homes of animals, 
huts of protein and mineral, keratin and calcium carbonate, though they weren't homes in the human sense in that the ocean creatures didn't hire architects and contractors, but made them themselves. They made them with sweat, he explained, or by sweating. And when they outgrew them, they left to sweat out a larger shell. And when they died, they left their shells behind. But no other ocean creatures would touch them because, he said, it is indecent to dwell in a shell you haven't sweated for. Cohen remembers his grandfather always trying to take his hand whenever he went to touch something, to take it. He remembers his grandfather always removing from his hand that something he'd taken and placing it back on the beach, placing it, not letting it fall exactly where it had been taken from. Joseph shocked his grandson by telling him that sand was made out of rocks, ground down into dust, he told him. Grinding is how it works, and Cohen was skeptical. Joseph also shocked his grandson by telling him that the clouds were made out of the same stuff the ocean was, water, the same stuff that he and his grandson were made out of, and that water was two parts hydrogen to one part oxygen brought together by covalent bonds. And then he told Cohen to take off his flip-flops and wade, and that the water was as old as the earth billions of years old, that the water they drank was billions of years old too. All water was, even the water inside him and his grandson. When they purchased a knish, you know, knish, a little potato pastry, from a boardwalk vendor, and Joseph requested water, and the vendor charged him a nickel, he said to Cohen, remember, when you drink it, this water is billions of years old and that you have stuff billions of years old inside of you, and that the chances are that the molecules, the atoms you're drinking have been in you before and so are now just coming home. And then Joseph said, you should never pay for water. You should maybe have to pay for the cup, but never for the water. Then it was fully night and the stars were in full relief and Joseph pointed out how they too had shapes like clouds or were as shapeable as clouds. Joseph pointed out Ursa's minor and major, the bears, and Orion, who could never lose or gain weight because his belt had only a limited number of notches, and the clawing crab, which he said had given its name to the disease he had, cancer, because the marks it left on the body were like pincer pricks. And then he said, and that constellation, that's the lobster thermidor, and that, that's the shrimp scampi. He said, they're incredible these constellations, how random they are, how arbitrary. The Chinese think Orion is actually a white cat playing with a purple bird. Or else it's the Japanese who think that about the Canis constellations, the dogs. Then, though Cohen was only dimly aware, his grandfather uh, continued to invent the constellations. That one over there, but he wasn't able to follow his grandfather's finger. That one over there is the praying rabbi. And Joseph waved his entire hand and pointed out, that one is the criminal mechanic. There, 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 there. And that one is the criminal nurse with the catheter needle. Just here. The east-west yarmulke, and that's the angry beard. You see? And he encouraged Cohen to find his own, and Cohen tried. Joseph went on to mention Europe. And Joseph was aware that his grandfather was talking about a land mass now and not stars. Think of our ancestors, Joseph said. They knew the very same stars, as old as water, older maybe. He said, pick one. And Cohen, when faced with all of those fantastical animals and archers, those electricians and plumbers, settled on the shiniest, and Joseph said, Polaris, the North Star. Common, he said, never be ashamed of the common. The common is useful, the common understands. Joseph th said that just as Cohen had a father, he, Joseph, had a father too. He still had one. He said his father had been named Yehoshua, Joseph said, which was just Joshua in Hebrew. In America, he cut ice. This was before refrigerators, before freezers, he would have to wait for the freeze 
It froze more often back then. It froze more thick. And then when the ice was sturdy enough, he'd venture out onto it, the ice over the river, and cut it out in blocks, cutting the ground out from under himself, like how the Israelites built the pyramids. He had many brothers and sisters, Joseph said. In America, people don't have that many brothers and sisters, even though they have the money to have a lot of brothers and sisters. I could never understand this. Joseph told Cohen that Yoshua was the eldest of eight or nine children, and Cohen asked how it was that his grandfather didn't know whether the number was eight or nine, and Joseph answered, old people have trouble remembering, young people have trouble knowing. Cohen was confused, and Joseph said, we left so young I barely knew how many hands I had, let alone how many fingers. Joseph said his parents, Yoshua and Chava, took him out of Beershad, but left their family behind. Uncles, aunts, brothers and sisters on both sides, cousins. It was difficult to stay in touch with the rest of the family, Joseph said, especially given all the turmoil. It wasn't like he could just pick up a telephone or send a telegram so easily. Rather, he could, Joseph said, but it wasn't like the family was always available to pick up the other end and reply. The post was unreliable too, especially for packages. Instead, Joseph said, we could only think certain thoughts, and they could only think certain thoughts. And, this was important, each half of the family had to know that's what the other half of the family was doing, Joseph said. At least that's how my father explained it. He told me he'd picked his own star, like Polaris. Lots of people pick Polaris, especially if they're young, especially if they live in the north, in the cold. And he told me that if he was in the mood to communicate with his family, he faced this star, not at a certain time or from a certain place, but whenever, wherever, and he talked to the star. Or he didn't even talk, he told me, he just poured himself into it, all of his life and frustrations, his feelings and dreams, he just poured all of himself into that fire. Then he told me, Joseph said, that I could do the same thing, that I could just find a star, any star, I could find my own star or I could use his star because any star has the capacity of all of them. And I could invest this star with my emotions. I could make this star the outside pocket for everything inside of me and that the family still over in Europe would have their own stars and would do this same thing too. All of them, all of us, sending and receiving. Joseph told his grandson that these communications would become stored in these stars from which they could be accessed not at a certain time or from a certain place, but at any time and from any place, and ultimately not just by the relations and friends they were intended for, but also by anyone sensitive enough to go seeking. Anything ever communicated to a star, Joseph told his grandson, could be accessed even after the death of its transmitter, and unlike with the spinning satellites and their transmissions, could be accessed and even altered by the dead themselves. And then he mentioned Omaiv, his wife, and encouraged his grandson to speak with her in this way freely. And then he mentioned himself and encouraged his grandson to speak with him in this way too, freely, once he himself passed away to the light on the other side of the darkness. He said, your father does this kind of thing now with machines, this internet, which I don't have to understand, because what it does, it isn't new to me. Returning back from the beach, Cohen turned to his grandfather and asked about daylight, pointing out that this star system worked only at night or in darkness, and furthermore, he studied at school how the sky was always changing around in circles, and if in some season the stars decided upon were present, in other seasons they were absent, and so access was not as universal as his grandfather said it was. Joseph turned to his grandson and said, tell it to Polaris. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. So maybe we should open it to any questions, if there are any. Yeah?
Yeah, 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 Chancellor. <coughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Joshua. Thank you for uh, your enlightening uh, conversation. Thank you. Um, I gather that the, your message is uh, that internet, or better, the way millennial generations is using internet mm -hmm. could be a threat to knowledge, poetry, imagination. But I, I wonder if uh, science mm -hmm. could be in danger. And this would be paradoxical, you know, the refusal of competence, refusal of knowledge. Is that part of your message or uh, am I weighing? I'm going too far or I'm <laughs> missing your point. <laughs> Thank you. Well, in any way, the guy had uh, a, a great fortune of having a grandfather yeah. to ask, you know, not Google. He had uh, a, a living Google, his grandfather. Thank you. I, I you know, I, I think everything is a threat <laughs> to, to literature. You know, I think the word beauty is a threat to literature. I think the word literature is a threat to literature. You know, it, it's like, uh, 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 but, but I don't know that I have a message, you know, with regard to the, the role of technology in, 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 in the future of the humanities. I think that, um, you know, in many ways that I leave that to the theorists you know, I, 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 I'm much more interested in describing how it feels to live with these technologies. I think that that's a, a far more interesting thing to, to do is to, is to actually be a realist novelist today. You know, to try and realistically describe um, the um, strange feeling of constantly being physically present in one place, but being mentally and emotionally able to access almost anywhere. I think that that, that um, internal dislocation um, uh, is, is of profound interest to me um, uh, as, a, uh, as a writer and as a reader. And I think, uh, 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 before you know, uh, I have a conclusion about the, the ultimate impact of these technologies, um, I, I need to spend a little bit more time describing how it feels to experience them. So you know, the evidence isn't in yet. <laughs> We're still waiting for the evidence. Uh, abbiamo il tempo per un'altra rapidissima domanda. A Joshua Cohen, se qualcuno <coughs> intende farla. Hmm? Anyone? One, right? Okay, hello. I apologize because I haven't read your book, but I was listening yeah. to what you were saying. And uh, what do you reply when people ask you, or if anyone has ever asked you, uh, isn't criticizing technology a form of like backward thinking, like narrow-minded thinking, because I've been told a similar thing whenever I criticize the negative effects yeah. of, of technology. I don't know if I have explained myself. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's uh, you know, at some point I woke up and the world just became this very black and white thing of, you know, is this good? Is this bad? Is this helping? Is it hurting? You know, and, and you know, are you a Democrat or a Republican? Like, you know, like, what side are you on, right? And I just, that's not why I started reading, right? I started reading because the world is just, is a world of ambiguity. And, uh, and, and I, I don't have, um, you know, these certainties are the things that I'm very skeptical of. Um, and the, the emotional or ideological position of certainty is something that I'm deeply skeptical of. 
And uh, uh, so, so I, I find that the, the value judgments or the attempting to, you know, categorize through some amorphous criteria of ethics or morality the, the worth or value of a technology to be folly in a way. Uh, I think the fact remains that people, that these technologies that people claim are distracting us are also responsible for a world in which people are reading and writing more than ever before. I mean, they might not be reading and writing the best, whatever that means, but they never were. Um, I, 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 I would just make that, that on a gray day, on a very gray day, I would just make a, a plea for grayness. We need more gray between the black and white. Allora, nel, uh, anche chi forse magari non conosce benissimo l'inglese, dalla lettura di Joshua Cohen ha sentito il ritmo e la musica di una prosa potente, evocativa e, e piena, di, piena di sfumature, <coughs> che nella, tra l'altro mi fa piacere segnalarlo, dato che faccio il traduttore, la, la traduzione italiana di Books of, uh, Book of Numbers è di Claudia Durastanti, uh, finalista al, all'ultimo premio strega che in America ha vissuto, quindi sono sicuro che è una traduzione molto valida. Possiamo fare gli auguri a Joshua Cohen, 39 years old today. Noi abbiamo, non abbiamo la candelina, ma una piccola torta di, simbolica oh, di, di compleanno. Thank you very much. E, thank you. e naturalmente avere la sua dedica nel giorno del compleanno sui suoi libri, entrambi disponibili, Moving Kings, un'altra occupazione, Book of Numbers, il eh, libro dei numeri, entrambi qui al nostro Anglo Libreria. Per quanto riguarda Accenti, ancora un applauso a Joshua Cohen e ci vediamo tra poco a parlare di uscire dall'euro oppure no, a mezzogiorno, sempre qua. A tra poco, grazie.